started. People in the back, hear me? Yeah. All right, thanks for everybody coming. Hope you brought your coffee. This is an early morning talk for a whole bunch of managerial stuff. Um, we're going to talk about how to implement security without a budget. So, uh, a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, feel free to take notes, record, take pictures. I don't care what you do. Um, don't feel obligated to, though. I will release these all on SlideShare. I'll post the link on my Twitter. You'll see it at the end of the slides. Uh, feel free to download, steal it, use it, whatever you want. If you like this presentation, I also do teach at SANS. Uh, SANS is probably one of the best uh, security institutions to go get your training and your certificates. Uh, I got a class running in Chicago. Uh, if you want me to come out here, reach out to me, reach out to SANS, request me. I'm sure we can make something work. This is part two of the three part talk. Um, we got zero day to hero day. That is taking a company from a massive ransomware attack, bringing down the entire infrastructure how we're going to recover from that, and how do we start a security um, implementation from scratch. That talk's out there, links there. A um, bunch of links in this presentation. Again, feel free to download, use them what you want, whatever you want. Given that talk down in B-Sides or Orlando at the end of the month, so if you want to come out, hang out in the sun with me, feel free to come down. This talk, we're starting basically from a basic IT implementation. Um, I'm assuming that you probably have a little bit of firewalls, you probably have an Active Directory group. You probably have the basics to run your systems. But we're looking to kind of start to implement security. Problem is, to implement security, we need a budget. And it's really hard to get budget. Um, anybody, uh, security mature. Who thinks they are a very mature security organization? Yes, good. You're all in the right place. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that, kind of how to start off from scratch to kind of get yourself to where you can start requesting budget and start talking to the board and start implementing your security. Last part of this series is how do we scale that now? So cool, we got a budget, we got a security organization. How do we scale this now for the enterprise? How do we get to the 100,000 user mark? How do we get to a 24-7 operation? So this is going to be a very biased response. Who here thinks that security is important to the enterprise? Most of you, if you're not raising your hand, I'm going to assume you're still sleeping from the keynote. Um, okay, uh, from those guys that kept their hands up, who thinks that their board thinks that security is important to the environment? That's a good, good amount. Um, lesser amount of hands, though. If you're looking around, it's about about half. So why? Why, if our executives aren't taking security serious, why aren't they? The media is. If you guys get breached, the media is going to poke fun of you until the next breach, right? What is that now, a week at dwell time? So, Marriott, Equifax, name your favorite breach over the last couple of years. There's probably a cartoon, there's probably a meme out there. You're going to take a big hit if you get breached. So, why aren't the executive boards really taking this seriously when we come to them, ask for money, and why can't we just kind of do our jobs and secure the environment? Who here talks to the board? Kind of somewhat routinely good. Good, good. We see a couple. So for those that you don't talk to the board, this is how the board sees our questions. The board's really good at making investments. They're good at taking a dollar and splitting it up against everybody that's asking for something. So every department's going to be asking the board for money to achieve their goals, to further the company. So we got all these different departments. We've got sales. Sales is going to be asking for money to run their advertising campaign. The advertising campaign is going to lead to more sales, leads to more revenue, leads to more bottom line. Same thing with R&D. They're going to develop new products for us, new efficiencies. More profit, more bottom line. IT. Who's been in IT for at least 20 years? Okay. How hard was it to get a budget for IT back in the day? It's still difficult, but IT's kind of figured this out. They figured out that, hey, we can offer these new efficiencies to the company, we can move quicker, we can reduce cost, more bottom line. What do we do with security? Anybody want to take a stab? Why do we need to invest in security? Softball question, yes? Reduce risk. Reduce risk. Why do we want to reduce risk? Risk is bad. Risk is bad. <laughs> what is it, though? High risk, high return. Right? Maybe we just want to run a really risky company, spend no money in security, Hopefully we don't get breached. I saw another hand. I was going to say, without your security in your IT, if you ever don't make any money. Without security, nobody else makes money. Excellent. 
Yes? Security can be a differentiator these days. Security can be a differentiator. Apple versus Windows. Sounds crazy, but Apple is taking over security. It's forcing Microsoft to develop better security tools. Windows Defender five years ago, it was a joke. Take a look at it now, it's not bad. So, we need money for security. We want not bad. <laughs> so, we need investments to prevent breaches. Give us more money, we're going to prevent more attacks. On the right hand side, this is the spend from 2010 to 2018 on cybersecurity in the United States. The more we spend, the less tax we have. Right? Oh. So this is a graph of cybersecurity incidents from 2009 to 2015. The more we spend, the more breaches we have. <laughs> it's a terrible investment. <laughs> so you know what? Maybe maybe I'm playing games with the statistics, right? Everybody knows that 87% of the statistics are made up on the spot. So let's take a real case example. Facebook, 2017, they stated they were going to double their expenditure to bolster security, an extra $7 billion to spend. Tail end of last year, everybody remember the view as bug? Breached about 50 million users, stealing user tokens you can log in from wherever you want as whomever you want. Maybe if they spent 15 billion, they would have prevented this one. Anybody know what this is? Elephant. Elephant in the room. Good guess. It's actually a whistle. Anybody hear of an elephant whistle? Okay, so I'm from Chicago, drove in last night, snowstorm kind of of your day. But I'll be walking down the street and you've got all these different street vendors trying to sell you whatever they're selling. This guy's sitting there with these wooden elephants. I'm like, hey, you know what? Those kind of look cool. I'll put it on the desk. I asked him how much it is. He goes, that's fifteen thousand dollars. What? Oh yeah, he goes, it's a it's a whistle. It keeps elephants away. <laughs> Dude, what are you selling me? Like, I'm looking for a little three dollar trinket that my kid can play with. No, 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 you don't understand. If you blow this whistle every day in the morning, it will prevent elephants. Come on, come on, man. Elephants in Chicago? He goes, I'm doing a great job, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> we got a name for this guy, right? How are we doing anything different in security, though? Boss, I need a new IDS system. You don't understand. The attackers are after us. We can't see them due to this new tactic. I need this new blinky box to prevent it. Okay, you want me to spend how much money? Well, yeah, yeah don't worry, it's $150,000. Okay, what's it going to do for me? It's going it's to prevent, prevent attacks. We're good, we're secure. Yeah, we know what that means. <laughs> so like I said before, executives, they are very, very good at very, very little. They are very, very good at understanding how your company makes money, what levers to pull to make more money, and they're very good at managing risk. Risk, that's what we deal with. We can speak their language. This conversation changes when we start talking with the executives and how they can understand us. If we have something about 900 or incidents a week, we have 600 some um, active investigations, we have a gap. We can't fill that extra 300. So if we take that extra 300 and compare it, it's roughly about a 33% increase in risk. If we know that a breach, you know, judging by our insurance policies or lawyers, whatever they're telling us, a breach is going to cost us a million and a half, we can take that increased probability and say, hey, we're going to save you half a million dollars a year. We only got to spend this $15,000 on this new tool, and we're going to save all this money. So that's the talk. Every questions? Yeah, no, 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 no. That is really hard to do. Who here thinks that they can actually justify this and be truthful and honest? No one? Oh, let's help them, hope them for some talk. Um, yeah, this, this is really hard, right? To do this, you need a ridiculous budget, you need a team of competent people, and then we can start asking for our money. Well, wait a minute. I just said that we need to spend a whole bunch of money to start asking for money. We got a technical term for this one. <laughs> so how do we break this? How do we kind of start this conversation so we can get to this maturity level, right? If we're starting from, yeah, we have a firewall, it's a little bit better. I mean, we have a security desk, maybe that's secure. 
You know, Frank, he's, he's our security guy. Well, <clears throat> today we're going to focus on CIS. CIS is Center of uh, Internet Security. They partner with SANS. They define the top 20 controls that they think that everybody should be doing. In all honesty, if you're doing these top 20, you're probably more secure than 85, 90% of the companies out there. Right? I don't care which framework you do. So my other talks here today, Hero Day talks about the NIST framework. This one's going to talk about CIS. Pick a framework that you're comfortable with, pick a framework you enjoy, and just go with that framework. Because all the frameworks are going to kind of boil down into an implementation plan that kind of looks like this. Discover, define, enforce, and monitor. And those steps. Because this is great. Do we start at step one, and then go to step two, and then go to step three? Well, maybe we start over here, because we already have this. If we take this and break it down into a fundamental implementation, we can start knocking off multiple bullet points with single systems, single solutions. So again, discover, define, enforce, monitor. Now, I did clickbait a little bit. I said it was the top 20. We're going to cover the top 16. Because 17 through 20 are really difficult to do with just tools. I can give you some homework on there, but trying to implement a security awareness tool, yeah, that's, that's not going to be a tool. That's going to be a culture change. But I can give you some good references to kind of start thinking about that and start motivating people to do this. So as we go through this talk, we do have to remember the security iron triangle. As we implement security, we're going to be reducing functionality. We're going to be reducing convenience. It's not our job to bring the ball all the way to security. The most secure system is one that's powered off and unplugged. It's not too functional to us. So we've got to remember this. We've got to keep the ball in balance. We have to give the business what they need, but we need to do it securely. We can't be the security sheriffs. We have to be enabling the business to function securely. All right. Should have bored you enough. Let's get into the meat. Discover. What are my devices? What are, what's running on my devices? I got any red team people in here? All right. Anybody know NMAP? Excellent. Like I said a few years ago at a Blue Team conference, nobody raised their hands. I'm glad to see this going. NMAP, mass scan. Mass scan, anybody? A lot less, all right. Mass scan is very similar to NMAP, but it's built for speed. You can actually scan the internet with this. So if you guys haven't seen this before, NMAP's on the left, left, left. Mass scan's on the right. NMAP, you can give it an IP address. You can give it a range of IPs. You can give it a range of ports. You can take all ports. What it's going to do, it's going to crawl your network, and it's going to look for open services. It's going to report what it finds. It also has a scripting engine that you can use to fire up vulnerability scans. You can find default passwords. You can find a lot of stuff out there. Okay? Mass scan is very similar. You can see we're scanning the internet, 0 slash 0. We're scanning from port 443. This will tell us every single Device on the internet listening on 443, most likely HTTPS, right? These are web, this is going to scan for every single web server ever. Minus 48. Cheat sheet to download. Not going to cover them. You can ping sweep, scan top 100 ports. There's a cheat sheet for MNET. Same thing for mass scan. Got a YouTube video out there. These guys scanned the internet and reported their findings. It is very, very interesting to see what is open to the world. Power plants, control systems, People's security cameras. Anybody? Shodan. Shodan? Yeah, good stuff there, right? If you want to be really creepy, Shodan. <laughs> now, when I say these tools are free, they are free as in free beer that you get after you move your friend cross country in that couch that probably shouldn't have came with. It was 1,400 pounds and you had to get it through three different doors. Yeah, this is kind of going to be a pain in the butt to do. Throw it into Excel. We don't have tools yet. But if you don't have a list of every device on your network, how do we know what we're trying to protect? We need to first find what we're trying to protect and somehow get this manageable. Blue team, best tool, Excel. If you put things into Excel, it gets done. Anybody used to work in the business? Excel is a super, super critical tool. Don't screw with Excel, especially with the accountants. All right, so now we know what we're trying to protect. What should be running on these devices? Here's your cheat sheet. PowerShell this. This will dump every installed application, version, and when it was installed. 
you might find some interesting things. I found a lot of video games out there. Illegal video games. Some stuff that you probably don't want to see. Okay? Figure out how to get this deployed to all your systems, get them talking back to your domain controller. This is going to give you a nice list of what's running, and then go and cherry pick what should be running. Okay? So now that we kind of have an idea of what we're trying to protect, what should be running, let's go define actually what we want to do. Okay? We're going to cover each one of these in detail, so I'm not going to read the slides. Privilege actions. Okay? I'm going to harp on this one, jump on a soapbox a little. Because anybody pen test, monitor pen test, manage the pen tester. All right, have you ever had a pen test report that said we did this and then we got domain admin and then we stopped? If you have DA, domain admin, you have keys to the kingdom, you can do whatever you want. Okay, most pen testing firms, if you don't give them a solid objective, they'll go for DA. So if that's the most valuable thing in your environment, let's lock it down. Okay. Here's your checklist, let's talk about how to do it. No administration from non-admin accounts. John Smith, he's an uh, SAP administrator. John Smith has an email address. He has a normal laptop. 90-some percent of your attack vectors is going to be external. So let's just segment him off. Let's make him use a different account. We're going to use John Smith admin. We're going to make him use a different machine. Okay? So if John Smith at ecorp.com gets compromised, yeah, we care, but we don't care too much. If his machine gets stolen, yeah, we care. We don't care too much, though, because they still have another step to go. Make sure that your jump box is actually a jump box. Though. Don't just create another virtual machine in the VDI environment and say, hey, we got jump boxes. Now, firewall this thing off. It's essentially a DMZ, really, really tight DMZ. Only allow whatever method you're allowing in. So let's say it's Windows. We're going to RDP to our jump box. Only allow RDP. Don't allow SMB. Right? That's going to let the attackers laterally traverse. We don't want to do that. We're trying to stop that. From the jump box, you're going to go into your database servers. Lock that one down. SSH, RDP, whatever administrator functions that you're doing, lock it down. Don't allow web browsing from your jump box. That's what we're trying to stop. Okay? You're going to get pushback from IT on this one because you are going to make their job a living hell. It's not bad. Most companies are doing it. Tell them, you know, we're trying to help you. But you get a couple great beards that, no, oh, this is going to impact everything. Well, okay, fine. How much time is it actually going to take you? Yeah, it's not that bad. No default admin passwords. Cisco, Cisco. Who has Cisco, Cisco running on their environment? <laughs> All right. So I did not see any hands, but I was monitoring smiles and chuckles. Everybody has Cisco, Cisco running still. Don't use Cisco, Cisco. It's bad. Okay? You have your list of devices, go through them. Change the admin passwords. Nmap has a couple scripts out there to just hammer Cisco, Cisco, admin, admin, administrator, blank. It'll hammer your web service for you and tell you which ones are running default threads. Okay? Change them. Make them long, make them complex, make them different. That way, if one machine gets compromised, they don't have keys to the kingdom yet. Throw them in a password vault so you don't have to remember these. These are going to be 64 characters of random crap. Throw them in the password vault. Keep that secure. Down here, don't forget your printers. Rego is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. HP, I think, is 1, 2, 3, 4. Or 0, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. Printers. Why do we care about printers? Anybody? Basic computers. Basically, computers, cool. They connect to AD. Excellent. So I can set up an LDAP listener on a printer. Forward me those usernames and password hashes. I'm just going to wait for a known password hash to look for the, what are we in now, winter 2019 or winter 2018. Maybe it had an exclamation mark, right? I'm going to throw that against my rainbow tables. I'm going to compromise your system there. Don't leave your printers open. This one's difficult. I'm not going to lie. Again, free as in free beer. This one sucks. Taking away domain admin from everybody. If we don't want a domain admin compromise, don't have domain admins. Delegate your controls out properly. Okay? Again, this is going to stop. Two commands up here. Net group domain admin domain. This is going to list out all your users in your domain that have domain admin. What it's not going to do is list out groups that have domain admin. Use this second one for there. Okay, it's a DS get command. It'll run. 
So it's about the groups that also have domain admin. You want to clean all this up. If you guys aren't following Ronnie Flathers at Ronda, he is a wonderful red teamer that specializes in Active Directory. I think he's moved now to containers, but he drops knowledge like no other. Go follow him. Bloodhound. Anybody Bloodhound? Excellent, excellent. Bloodhound uses a basic user credential on your domain, dumps out domain, and it's going to give you a map. If you don't know what your domain looks like, go download this, go run it. Go find out what your domain looks like. It's going to give you a nice network map. It's going to give you canned queries on top 100 hosts that have multiple people. If you right click on a machine, you can find out who has admin to it or how they could get admin to it. Tons of tutorials out there, tons of YouTube videos. Go check it out. Laps. Anybody run laps? Good, good. Hey, 30%-ish. Go do this. It's a free tool from Microsoft. Um, local admin passwords on a laptop. How many people have one local admin across their environment for all their desktops? Again, please don't raise your hands. I don't want to know. <laughs> I'm seeing the chocolate. Okay. It's so who's actually deployed it here? How easy is it? Very easy. Very easy. The hardest part about this is going to be scheduling the meetings to get it done. Okay, here's the steps. No joke. Go download it. Go install it. What it's going to do is it installs basically an agent on every laptop. It's going to rotate the local admin password. You give this to your help desk or admins, whoever needs it. It's going to give you a computer name search and then it'll spit back the password. If you need to change the password because of either compromised, lost password, just change it. It'll, it'll talk to AD, changes the passwords for you. Solves local admin. So we've got our user base now somewhat you know, in a box. We kind of like where it is. Let's talk about devices now. DOD people, Stigs, anybody? I hear groans. I know you people. Stigs are terrible, but they get the job done. Okay? If you don't have a golden image based off of a checklist, go get a checklist. Go lock down your golden image. At least at this point of deployment, you know the system is somewhat compliant and secure. If you have it, go to NIST, go search what you're looking for, download the checklist. Okay? There's a whole bunch of resources in here. They have canned GPOs. Okay? You can download the GPOs, they have everything there for you to implement. They even got the reports ready for you. Very small eye chart, but this says add your domain admins here. Right? This is DOD standards. I'm not saying they're good, but if you're DOD standard, you're probably better than a lot of other people. This is a pain in the butt to manage. How do we know we're compliant? Well, this is where the SCAP tools come in. SCAP. Uh, Security Content Automation Protocol. What this is going to do is you give it the checklist, and it's going to scan and find out where you're not compliant. Okay? There's open SCAP free tool. Runs on all your platforms. Problem is, it's only limited to scan open source machines, right? Any of your Nixes. Okay, you load in your sticks, you select what type of classification you want, and it's going to spit out everything that's going to look for you. Press scan, it comes back with your results. And I said, great, this works for Nix boxes, but what do we do with our Windows systems? Well, luckily, Qualys is, Qualys here? I'm not sure if Qualys is here, but Qualys is a huge company. They have a free tool out there to try to sell you stuff. They'll give you a subset of machines that, it's, last time I checked, it was 15 to 30 machines that you can scan for free. You do the exact same thing with your stigs, it'll come back. I don't think that the automated remediation is built into the free tool. I think they have that in their paid version. But 15, 20, that's probably good enough to get us a solid golden image base. We're doing it for free. Then we can go to our boss and say, hey, do we want to continually monitor and make sure we're not falling out of compliance because we have DevOps running now. We have all these people with system admin credentials. We need to make sure that they're not opening up something. So that's when we go out and start looking at commercial tools to monitor this stuff. Huh? Device level, covered. Go to the network. Everybody has a firewall, right? God, everybody have a firewall, right? Yeah, thank you. It probably looks something like this, right? You're somewhat segmented. You got something like a user VLAN, a server VLAN, an internet, right? I want us to move a little bit better. This is where we improve our network security framework. We move to almost a role-based access control. Uh, zero trust. Anybody 
research zero trust. It's a pipe dream. Nobody's ever getting there. Sorry. <laughs> what we can do, though, is kind of lock it down to a role base, right? We got finance people that need to get to finance systems. There's no reason your IT admin has to go read your financial 10Ks before you release it to the public. You're just opening up problems. Lock down your systems, okay? Role base. We're going to categorize all of our people in the roles. Hopefully you have a org chart. That's the biggest joke in the world, right? Nobody has a solid org chart on who does what in their company. Thank you, I see claps. <laughs> so once we somewhat have this in there, talk about what they need, right? Finance is going to need access to your FI modules and SAP. They're going to need their custom applications to trade. They're going to need access externally then to Fidelity or whatever bank you're using, Robinhood for their crazy long puts on Supermicro. <laughs> <laughs> IT system admins, they're going to tell you they need access to everything. That is wrong. They don't need access to everything. Challenge that. Figure out exactly what they need access to. Put that in there. And then IT, this is probably a pretty solid list for external access. They need Google and they need Reddit. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Easy things that you can do, client side. Turn on the client side firewalls. Window firewall looks pretty good. You're still going to need some more firewalls, but at least you can block the client to client. Don't allow the peer connections. There's no reason that Joe User needs to talk to John Smith over 135, 137, and 445. Right? Why are those ports? Anybody? SMB. Thank you. SMB. We're going to do the same thing with all of our data. This also sucks. Um, <laughs> number one, how many people here know where all their data is? Yeah, nobody. Try your best. We're starting from scratch, right? We need to build momentum. You're going to get 80% of your benefit with 20% of your work. It's actually a real thing. It's not a managerial thing that we throw out. Okay? There's no reason. IT admin needs to get the jobs files or the financial records. Let them get the system fixed, right? Exact same process. Really similar Excel sheet. Again, Excel. If you put in Excel, it will get done. Okay. So we defined our devices that we're trying to protect. We talked about users. We talked about network. How do we actually enforce this now? That's cool. We got a great story. What do we do now? I'm going to cheat on a few of these because I don't want to talk about backups. If you guys aren't doing backups, we need to have a different conversation. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Implement firewalls and trust boundaries. All right. We already covered. We all have firewalls. How many people have micro-segmented their network, though? That's a hard, hard thing. Right? What we need to do is start talking about these trust boundaries. Now, anybody want to take a stab at a trust boundary definition? Shout it out. I got t-shirts. Right. Inside, outside, border. Excellent. I got a small, large, or extra large? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the sand. <laughs> Excellent. Inside, outside. Huh? East, west. Small, large, extra large. Okay, we're going deep here. Close, close. I'm going to blame the sheet right now. <laughs> okay, we're talking about any point that we are having a user context change, basically. If I'm a financial user, I'm trusted to financial systems. If I'm a financial user and I try to go to an IT system, that's a trust boundary. We're going to lock that down. There's no reason your financial people need to see your system configurations. Okay? Now, firewalls. Anybody using really expensive firewalls? Palo Alto, Juniper, Cisco, everybody, right? We need to somehow build a business case on this. Because they're not just going to come, oh yeah, you need $10 million to do this great. Start small. PF Sense. Anybody play with PF Sense in the labs? Yes. Good, good, good. How is it? Anybody? It's good, right? All right it does the job. Is it dirty? Eh. It's not pretty, but it does the job. We're going to get down to our role based. We're going to segment the networks. Okay? If you guys haven't played with PF Sense, go play with it. It's great. If you don't have firewall experience, go download it. Put it in your home network. See what it does. Okay? Here's the links. Download the ISO, throw it up in a virtual environment. There's the links there. Install page looks like that. You just basically default, 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 default. And then go configure it. It's going to give you a GUI, um, GUI out here. Here's your rule base. Okay? You got source port, destination port. 
and you're going to have your actions on there, just like a normal firewall. Okay, this topic, 13, data protection, talks about DLP. DLP is really hard to do free. It's also really hard to do with money. If anybody has DLP actually locked out, I want to talk to you at the after party, please. I'll give you a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> there is some easy things that we can do though. Encrypt the client hard drive. So when a HR person loses their computer at the latest meetup or whatever HR does, it's encrypted at least, right? Yeah, we all find we got cold boot attacks and all this crap. I don't care about that. If we have to worry about a cold boot attack against a computer, we have different problems to talk about. Okay? No writing external drives. This one's also hard politically. It's very easy to do technically. Okay? Cheat sheet. There's your GPO to encrypt all your hard drives. Who's not running a Windows environment that is capable of BitLocker? It's Windows 7 and above. I'm glad to see nobody with XP. Okay? There's your GPO. Same thing with external drives. This is going to prevent people from writing to a USB drive, right? We're at a security conference, so we have to say, hey, so this is going to prevent exfiltration of data off of your computers. Yeah, it will. No, what this is going to prevent is somebody copying your employee roster with social security numbers onto a USB for their personal backups and then losing the USB drive. Don't let people do that. <coughs> DNS filtering. Who's running a pie hole at home? Good, good. Easy to set up? Very easy. Okay, for those that don't know, pie hole, it is a DNS filter, basically. And you're going to give it a block list. It's going to act as your DNS server. If you try to go to evil.com, it's going to block you. It is that simple. They call it the Pi Hole because it can run on a Raspberry Pi. Great for home, probably not good for the enterprise. That's okay. Stand up a Linux box, run this command, it's going to install for it. Configure your block list. I have my block list up there. I haven't updated it in about six months, but it's pretty good. There's about 50 block lists that I use. It still runs on a Raspberry Pi, so it's not system intensive, but it's going to get your ransomware trackers, it's going to get your C2s, it's going to get anything evil, basically. Go out there, download it, import it into your Raspberry Pi, or whatever you're using to run Pi-hole, and you're done. Put your DHCP to your new DNS server. You're going to block a whole bunch of traffic. All of a sudden, your traffic utilization is going to drop. Anybody watch what CNN is injecting into our pages? It was something like 127 URL redirects last time I looked. We don't have to load those anymore because we're going to block them. So this is twofold. You get security and performance. Great. Sell that to the board. All right, I told you I was going to cheat on a few of these. Here's my cheat sheet. Backups. Whoever's not running backup, I want to talk to you. We'll make sure that your ops team is running backup. So three, two, one rule if you haven't heard about it. Three copies of your data, two different medias, one offsite, right? All right, here's a good question. Who still runs actual tape backups? I will tell you, it saved my ass a couple times. Okay, ransomware. If you don't have offloaded media, I don't care if it's disconnected DASD, sorry, that's main current turns, disconnected storage, somehow make sure that if you get ransomware, your backup servers are protected from the ransomware. Because how many people are running Commvault, Symantec, anything? They're running on Windows devices, and they have SMB open because that's how they work. And by the way, their credentials also need domain admin privileges. Ransomware will eat that up. They're going to rewrite your backups. Don't let them do that. Wireless. Who here is running WEP still? This is why I can cheat on this one. That's good. If you are running WEP and just embarrassed, come talk to me afterwards. I'll explain why it's bad. <laughs> guest networks. Who here has segmented their guest networks from their corporate LAN? Good. Those that aren't brazen, that's fine. I assume you're not paying attention, but if you haven't segmented this, please come talk to me, I'll tell you why. Who knows how long it takes to crack your guest, your guest password? Who includes that into pen test scopes? On, I have this password that allows access into my environment. How long does it take um, you know, a half a million dollar rig in AWS to crack? You want to make sure your rotation of that is less than the time to crack. So if I have a pretty good password, it's going to take like 35, 36 days to crack up in AWS. Set your rotation to 30 days. That way, if they crack it, it's already old. Antivirus. Who wants to talk about antivirus at a security conference? Exactly. So here's my take on antivirus. Do it. It's not going to help us much, but do it. 
Because if you get breached and you're not running antivirus, what's the headline going to read on the news story? Chrome, when you're not running antivirus, get breached. Imagine that, right? Antivirus is kind of like taking a multivitamin. Who takes a multivitamin during the day? <laughs> Who's going to argue that multivitamins are bad for your health, though? Do it, right? Do AB. If you guys aren't cynical about AB, Black Hills every year opens up the year with cash cow tipping. They take a vendor or two and show how easy it is to subvert their antivirus, okay? Egypt, if you guys don't know Egypt, go follow him too. He's been great, okay? He calls this kicking puppies, all right? And laughing. This year, I think they took on Carbon Black, I think it was this year. And, um, Whoa, we block PowerShell. Well, all you have to do is break up the PowerShell.exe call into POW plus Urshell.exe, and it bypasses everything. Because it's only looking for that complete. So if you execute it as a string, it bypasses everything, and you get whatever you want. But again, make sure you're doing it, because you just don't want to deal with the media outbreak when you do get breached, and you will get breached. Okay. So we got some enforcement in there. How do we make sure that we're actually enforcing stuff? Splunk. Anybody got Splunk? Anybody not want to pay Splunk anymore? <laughs> Splunk, yeah, Splunk is great. I haven't been to a place that doesn't use it. I haven't been to a place that likes paying for it, though. So Splunk is a big ticket item, if you don't know. It is, it is big. Okay? We'll get to that. First, vulnerability management. Who's got a vulnerability management program? Okay. For those that don't, let's talk about this. There's two products out there that I'm going to talk about. This is going to be one of the only times I actually talk about a paid version, and you'll see why. So these are two versions. OpenVAT. This is an open source vulnerability program. Okay? You run this in your environment. It's going to tell you what machines are vulnerable and why. This is your punch list for your work coming up. It's going to show you all your outdated Java, and it's going to show the exploits against it. It's going to show you your outdated Adobe. Going to show you, you know, um, so Java, Adobe is going to probably account for 50% of your vulnerabilities. Get those updated. The rest are going to be Windows patches. Once in a while, you're going to find a really cool vulnerability, go patch it. But really, if you are keeping a constant patch cycle in your applications and your operating systems, this is probably going to be manageable. If you're not, yeah, it's going to light up red. Nessus looks very similar, doesn't it? Nessus. Open Vaz. Nessus costs three grand a year for licensing, I think, off the shelf. Negotiate that down. It's essentially free for an environment when we're talking about, you know, at scale, three grand for security. Not terrible. But let's talk about how to sell that. We can run an Open Vaz. Nessus offers a seven day or 30 day trial, whatever they're at now. Run both of them side by side. See the differences in the reports. Nessus is going to give you a more granular view of the vulnerabilities. Open Vaz is free. It's maintained by us, right? It's the community. Nessus, they got paid resources and researchers to build better signatures, okay? So if you need to make that business case, run them both side by side, compare what you're seeing, what you're not. Three grand, that'll be good. Security Onion, anybody play with this one? Okay. I'm going to briefly go over Security Onion because this is like a week-long course to get this going. It is wonderful. Anybody here of Cali Linux for the Red Teamers? Okay, Security Onion is basically Cali for the blue teamers. It's going to come with all these hand tools to operate a fully functional SOC. Okay? Some of my favorites, we're going to get full PCAP from NetSniff. We got um, IDSs both at the network and the host level. And we got our analysis and presentation layers, right? So this is going to collect our data, analyze the data, and then show us the data. Splunk only does one of these. Okay? Again, it's going to be the same pattern as everything else. Download the ISIL, install it, and have fun. Okay, these are just some of the dashboards that I like to look at. Top left is Kibana running. So Kibana is part of the Elk stack. It's basically the open source version of Splunk. Don't throw tomatoes at me. I know it's not exactly, but it will get you 90% of the way there. So go up there. It's a, basically an event viewer. You can give this to your SOC. Same thing with Elsa-ish. This is showing a whole bunch of real logs, or sorry, Zeke logs now. We've got to be up to date. Um, Snorby is another one. Go play with the tools. See what you feel is the best for you, and then start building on that, right? And then start comparing the tools. See what you like. See what you want to implement. Again, it's all free. And there's a lot of tools out there. There's 60-some tools out there. 
Go check it out. Go have fun. If you guys want to take actual learning, here's a link here. I think it's like a hundred bucks, but they run you through exactly how to set it up, what tools are useful, how to get the most value out of it. So go have fun. Okay. This is where I cheat again. This is your homework. Okay. 17 through 20. These are organizational maturity process. These are really hard to solve with a tool. I can give you a couple tools for it, but when we're talking about implementing security awareness and training program, that you're going to have to talk, right? This is fine. You can go run a phishing campaign. There's tools out there, right? Dave Kennedy has a social engineering toolkit. It's got a lot of stuff for him there. But take a look at SANS. They got the Ouch newsletter. It's a free newsletter. Subscribe to it. It's going to give you a good idea how to phrase your stuff to your users because you can't just tell them, oh, there's this vulnerability out there. Don't click on it. No, it's going to put it into a user relatable terms. Uh, where are we at? 18. Application security software or application software security. Who here works in a development shop? Okay, some of us. Cool. If you guys need help, go look at OWASP. They've done a lot of this stuff. OWASP top 10. For those that aren't aware, they list the top 10 web vulnerabilities out there. They haven't changed in the last 30 years. We're still looking at SQL. I. We're still looking at Buffalo Overflows, right? Let's get better at it. Incident response and management. Who here has a fully dedicated team to incident response? It's really hard to get to. If you're running a big corporation, you probably have it. If you're a smaller business, you probably don't. Shit, it's the fan, it's going to be you, right? Make sure that you have it in the back of your head at least what you're going to do. This book, it's a little dated. I forget how old, 10, 15, 20 years. Stuff hasn't changed. When you have a disaster, you're going to go through the same thing over and over again, right? Pen test, red team exercises. Who here knows at least how to compromise 0867? Okay, yeah. So here's an interesting thing. Um, so I asked red teamers, no red teamers, we're all blue teamers then. Who doesn't identify with the binary um, identifications, right? Okay, so we need to start closing this gap. If I'm a boxer and I'm just here to defend, I'm going to go into the boxing room like this, right? If I don't know what a punch looks like, if I don't know how to throw a punch, I'm going to get my ass kicked. Okay? Start learning how these people are attacking you. Start learning the tools that they're using so you can develop your defenses against them. It's a good book out there. About that big. Walks you through step by step on exactly how to compromise a box using Metasploit. How to use a buffer overflow. So you can start seeing these things. Right here, I got a link. All these are links to wherever you need to go to buy this prep. That's a link to hackthebox.eu. Okay? Hack the box EU is what I call vulnerability server as a service. You log in, they got 20 some vulnerable machines out there. You can go practice against. There's a leaderboard, it's all cool. Go have fun with this. These are machines out there that they built for you to attack. There's retired machines out there. What I mean by retired is you're allowed to post the walkthrough and solutions to these machines. So all you have to do is go look up a YouTube video on somebody that's already solved this and actually just hands on the keyboard, watch them do it as you're doing it, you're going to pick up a ton of stuff, okay? It's going to become very, uh, very much apparent. It's going to become very apparent on how these people are getting into your environments and how you can stop them with simple things. Okay? Whew. All right, that's top 20. I got five minutes to spare. I got questions? Yes, yes, it's great. Do you feel, after that class, do you feel that you could go home and start laughing this stuff up and somewhat run it? I did. So, yeah. Exactly. Again, I'm a little biased on SANS because I do work there. Um, it's really rubber meets the road. We're trying to give you guys the best experience so you can actually take what you're learning and go implement it. There's a lot of certificate programs out there. Um, CIS, please. All right, how tall does a fence need to be to protect your data center? <laughs> I also have my CISP. So I also teach the class to get your CISP. So, yeah, um, HR filter. I look at SANS certs much better because you can actually do stuff afterwards. Okay? I'm not going to go build a fence around my data center target. Hit it again here. But one of the things that we saw when we started doing ad blocking is a huge reduction. 
Um, and you're running around the cell. Notice I made it. Yeah, you're right. Because if you're stopping your C2 channels, you're stopping their control, right? I don't care if you breach my perimeter, you're not leaving with my stuff. Okay? Everybody here has a house or lives somewhere, even if you don't live somewhere you're homeless. How hard is it for somebody to break into your home? They're going to break a window and get in. I'll tell you what, though, I know where the squeaky floorboards are, I know where my valuables are. And you know what? They're not leaving with anything. Okay? <laughs> we want to do the same thing in security. It's okay if they breach us. Don't let them leave with anything. Shirt size. Oh, deep <laughs> I got extra larges and smalls. I saw a question. Um, this is more about the beginning of your presentation. Why is it so difficult for us to have? Because so getting to those numbers is difficult, right? We don't want to sell elephant whistles. We want to have statistics to back us up. How many here are forensics responders, forensicators? We need to build our cases based on pure evidence. Okay? We need to do the same thing with our budget. We need to prevent or present evidence on how we're getting our budget. We can't just go out there and say, hey, we need this because that's what the pamphlet said at RSA, right? Anybody going to RSA? Cool. <laughs> but uh, we, we have to stop buying blinky boxes and actually understand what we're implementing and get to that evidence so then we can start talking about how do we start this maturation process. Answer? Maybe? What are your thoughts on flipping the privileged access workstation? So you, you log in by default with your elevated credentials and go somewhere else for your daily driver. I've heard a number of people say that if you're on your daily driver, it can get compromised, you get a keylogger, you then remove it somewhere else, you just get the bad guys with credentials. Yep. That works as well. That is harder to do. It is? Yes. If you want to do that, yes, do that. Yes, I like that idea a lot because Really, how much of us need to read emails? How much email is garbage to us, right? So, yeah, I mean, I've seen physical implementations of this too. You got two different laptops, right? One laptop does not have an internet connection. That's where you're going to your networks, right? So yes, I like that idea a lot. Which one? That what he was talking. Yes. So, if I'm John Smith admin, right? So John Smith, my normal daily driver, that has internet, has email. When I want to do privileged stuff, I'm going to remote into a secured box, right? He wants to flip that. So I'm John Smith admin. I log into my privilege access box. If I want to get to email or internet, I'm going to remote into an unsafe environment. Because that way, if my user account gets compromised, I don't have the link back. Right? So the environment that I'm remoting into, I need a whiteboard. <laughs> I got two minutes. You got it? That hurts my head, yeah. Okay, I can talk to you later. All right, I'm out of time. Thank you, everybody. If you want extra large or small, Small. Yeah. Yeah. We got two extra large.